You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. Hi, I'm Jay Farner, CEO of Quicken Loans, America's largest mortgage lender. Spring will be here soon, so if buying a new home is on your to-do list, right now is the time to call Quicken Loans. Learn about which mortgage options make sense for you and get a jump on your competition. With our exclusive Rate Shield approval, the low rate you lock today is protected for up to 90 days while you shop for your new home. With a Rate Shield approval, if rates go up, your low rate stays locked. But if rates go down, you get that new, even lower rate. Either way, you win. Talk to us today at 800-QUICKEN or go to rocketmortgage.com to take advantage. Here's another great reason to work with us. For a record nine years in a row, J.D. Power has ranked Quicken Loans highest in the nation in customer satisfaction for primary mortgage origination. Again, to lock in today's low mortgage interest rate and get the security of our exclusive rate shield approval, call us today at 800-QUICKEN or go to rocketmortgage.com. For J.D. Power award information, visit jdpower.com. Rate shield approval only valid on certain 30-year fixed rate loans. Call for cost information and conditions. Equal housing lender. License in all 50 states. NMLS number 3030. Hi, welcome to this Subway ad for the new Sesame Ginger Glaze Chicken Signature Wrap. How would you like it? I'll take a... Sports announcer at home? Yeah, how'd you... We just know. My wife picks up the new signature wrap. It's got double the rotisserie style chicken mixed with a sesame ginger glaze. She appears annoyed at me, but she shrugs it off. Those sweet and savory flavors are calling her name. She lifts the wrap and she takes the bite. Incredible. And now she's closing the door on my subway. Make it what you want. Limited time only at participating restaurants. Double meat based on average six inch sub. I'm little teapot, short and stout. Here is my handle and here is my spout. No, dad, like this. When I get all steamed up, then I shout, tip me over and pour me out. (laughs) This is WWE superstar Roman Reigns. It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. Visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. Thoughts of suicide may feel impossible to overcome. But with help and support, you can find hope and meaning. Call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK to speak to a counselor or visit suicidepreventionlifeline.org. It's free. It's confidential. It's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And even if it feels like it, you are not alone. Welcome to Thursday night at KLR, and this is Disasters in the Making, and I am Brad Slager, entertainment writer at a number of outlets. Sorry for the uh, late start off tonight. We had small tech issues we had to conquer, and we managed to do just that, so we are rolling along now to get you ready for the weekend coming up. This is one of the extravagant entertainment bonanzas we deliver for you. Your bad movie Bad Hollywood, bad entertainment news outlet. That is us. And joining me on each of these escapades is my partner from ScreenRant.com, Paul Young, who is on the road. If I'm not mistaken, Paul, you are in O-Town tonight, are you not? I am. You know, it would be great if O-Town was actually performing here. Uh, that would be <laughs> amazing. I haven't heard a boy would band it be, play in a while. Would it be great, Paul? <laughs> it, it would. 
I mean, I'm like a lot. Maybe I maybe I like some Motown back in the day. Maybe I got an O Town Spotify list. You don't know, Brad. Don't um, judge me. I, it wasn't judgment. It was really a surprise, actually, is what I was well, expressing. For what I'm doing is actually setting you up so that it doesn't appear as bad when I tell you I'm at a board gaming convention in Orlando. Well, See, this, uh, it, it softens the blow. Pretty much what I expected, actually. Not shocked by that. So uh, th- this is we're, one of the larger ones it. that takes place, is it not? Nah, this is a brand new one. This is their oh. inaugural season. Yeah, the um, first ever that they're doing there's only about 800 people going to show up over the next 52 to 60 hours or so but uh so starting tomorrow at nine o'clock in the morning they will game until midnight on sunday you can come in and out they only ask to take one shower a day some of these people probably need more than that but i'm not judging (laughs) that's that's probably not going to make it in the ad copy of the brochure or at least no but it's next year but it is understood (laughs) <laughs> so do you actually go through these uh like marathon sessions where you're actually at the table for 12 18 hours yeah. of stretch? so we went last year i got to take my daughter she graduates this year last year was gonna be my last summer with her and i wanted to spend some time so me my best friend uh her and his daughter we all went to orlando again for a different conference and we spent four days playing games uh we got here at eight o'clock in the morning and we did not leave till 10 o'clock that night and we played games the entire time I played 53 games, 53 actual sessions of gaming over the course of four days, and it was amazing. That's uh, that's pretty hardcore. I know. Hey, back in college, back when I could do this even longer, I was we watched 52 hours of movies in a row, nonstop, over the course of um, like a, some sort of break. Like it wasn't spring break; it was a different break. We went to one guy's room. We went and rented nothing but movies in VHS form, because this is in the early 90s. And it was called the 52-hour No Chick Flick Film Festival. It became so popular and had so many people, we went through 300 uh, carafes of coffee, 300 pitchers of coffee, over the, <laughs> and of course, that 32 hours, 52 hours. And the dean of the school came by and watched movies with us for six hours. Just sitting on be- sitting on a beanbag with the rest of us, just watching movies. And we watched stuff like Rambo and Predator and you know Chuck Norris movies and Red Dawn, all the good stuff, you know, all that good good movie man stuff. Before they started trying to give us feelings and crap. Back in the old days, I guess, as you would say. Yeah, back in the old days. My God, that was like that's almost twenty five years ago. Lord, listen to you getting. I'm aging <laughs> misty and eyes, wistful Brad. about this moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, in similar fashion, in a way, or maybe on the dark side of your little story, there's since our last episode, they had the Oscars take place at Hollywood. Did you manage to uh, catch that? You know, I don't know. You know, I just pick it up on Twitter. I, I let other people tell me what my opinion should be on these movies I haven't seen. Yeah, that's kind of. Um, it's kind of fallen in my lap each year to be the, uh, <laughs> I got to be the sacrificial one who goes and sits through the entire episode, live blogging it and coming up with commentary in real time. Thankfully, thank the stars thank manage. Oh, uh, it's, you know, I do it for the people. I, it's because I love basically. Yeah, you do. Not love Hollywood. But, uh, yeah, this, uh, they, they managed to deliver enough material to make it somewhat easy. I was rather uh, rather touched this year, for instance, when Brad Pitt won for Best Supporting Actor. Well-deserved, I'm going to say, for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. But he was up there and managed to uh, you know, give a little bit of a shout-out to John Bolton, of all people, complaining that he didn't have an opportunity to testify in front of Congress. I was no, that makes sense. kind of... Uh, Kind of surprised by the fact that Hollywood was taking the side of John Bolton because I seem to recall they had hated his guts for a period of time. I'm going to say decades. They don't remember where they put their morals, much less where they, what they, who they were supporting. Remember they they hated or they loved Avenatti. Now mm-hmm. they now they want nothing to do with him. <laughs> they or maybe his they name. do. They might want still want him to run for president and try to take out Bernie. It's possible. Well, I mean, even at this point, he could have a life sentence, but if he was on the ticket, they would still support him over Trump. So it's uh, just kind of the way that goes. 
But it was a little bit of a surprise. I don't know if you do any handicapping or not, but I kind of throw it out there, and I, I make my picks usually on the Friday before the show. This was a tough year, though. A lot of uh, a lot of the categories were kind of up in the air. I did okay. I think I went something like eleven and eight altogether. But that's missed not bad. Some, missed some of the big ones because uh, I, I hit every single acting category. I got cinematography. I split on the scripts. You know, best screenplay. Um, hair and makeup. I nailed. Big upset there, and I called that one for. Uh, bombshell i saw that one but yeah the, really they gave that the bombshell yeah they did actually i figured i'm starting to think they just like they want to give hair and makeup to any movie margot robbie's in hmm. that's wouldn't two be, in a row wouldn't be a bad call there actually but the no, uh, the shock of the night was for best picture and best director because the, everybody including myself thought 1917 was going to be the shoe-in for that you know it's a big war epic had the massive trick directing going on, and uh, even Sam Mendes was the favorite coming in for Best Director. One at the Golden Globes, one at the Directors Guild even. So I thought, okay, there you go. You, you can pretty much assure he's getting that trophy. And nope, the big upset winner of the night was the South Korean movie Parasite. Still haven't seen it, but I have seen The Host, and The Host is a very good movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, same director. In fact, um, Gordy and I even uh, brought that one up last week. Very well done movie. It's uh, it's kind of a creature feature, but done in an art house style almost. There are subtitles, of course, because it's South Korean, but it's well worth it. It's got a great monster, but it's also got great interaction with the people and the monster. So the directing on it is really top notch. Definitely say go check that one out. But yeah, Parasite is more of a uh, psychological adult drama, dark humor, social commentary kind of stuff. Hollywood fell in love with that movie. I mean, it was... You, Did they you felt fall the, in love with the movie or they fall in love with the diversity of the movie? I, I think it was the film itself because you know I'm watching the award shows leading up to the Oscars. You know, the SAG Awards and the Screen Actors Guild is that one. Uh, Directors Guild. I even saw some clips from the producers just so I can get a feel for it. And every time... It was even mentioned in a category it was nominated in. The crowd was always louder for it. And the crowd at these events are the industry people, the members of the Academy. So that kind of fit me off. I knew it was going to win for best foreign movie. That, that was a lock. Bet the rent there. Do it. Done. But for it to also win for best overall is amazing. And it's... I, you could say it's worthy. I, I think at least it's one of those movies that years from now is going to hold up. I think people will still talk about it. You know, unlike, you know, you go back the last five to ten years, I think maybe one or two movies that won Best Picture, you'll be like, oh, yeah, sure, that one. The rest you'll be like, oh, that's right, I forgot it won. That's, oh, true. You know, it's usually the case at the Oscars. <laughs> yeah, no, I have, I, I, and I guess I need to see it. I just haven't had a chance to get around to it. You have you watching some other crap movie this week. So it's well, because I haven't seen this one, I'm blaming it on you. Yeah, I was going to uh, slide into this and say that the um, the way we were going to honor the Oscars was we were going to honor the movie Parasite. By doing the movie Parasite, not the one that won for Best Picture, however. And um, I'm just going to come out and say it to everybody listening – I think I got Paul quite angry with this selection. I just I feel like I need that time back, Brad. And I don't <laughs> say that about many movies that I watch. I feel like you owe me an hour and 20 minutes or whatever this thing was. Well, that was kind of by design. Not that I was trying to, you know, get you notably upset. But I just figured that, you know, we're going to honor the Oscars and one of the best movies historically recognized we would probably have to do something completely in the opposite direction. This is for the people listening. This is, this is how mad this movie made me. I'm watching it <laughs> last night at like one in the morning and I pick up the phone and I text Brad and went, what have you made me watch? And he answered to his, <laughs> to his, I, um, his credit. I don't shy he away from this. Me back. 
<laughs> when you get a text at one in the morning, you, it's never good. And this one went right with that. It was not good. I was like, Brad, what's happening here? What am I watching? There's well, like a hairy dude in the shower. What I mean, you know, come on. Yeah, see, and when you text me last night, I was actually just wrapping up our live coverage of the Democratic debates. So I didn't feel bad for you whatsoever. (laughs) (laughs) We had just done an hour and a half live coverage. And before that, I did an hour at Red State on the live blog. So I was inundated with um, something far less entertaining. And I'm going to go out and say it far more stupid. Well, you know, uh, which is a low bar to crawl under and yet they managed to. But (laughs) what we are talking about here um, is the same movie called Parasite. However, this one is from 2004 and it is a British production. Was it British? Yes, actually it is. It's uh, I know the cast you could tell was, you know, mixed Brit. They didn't have heavy accents, but a few of them had notable ones. Curiously enough, the guys that looked like they were from East Germany were the most English. And (laughs) what we're talking about plot-wise here is essentially alien on an oil rig. But that's only because we are really giving you the Cliff Notes version of things here. And that's a lot high and mighty compared to what we actually see take place on screen. It is, uh, it is not alien quality. Mm -mm. The creature, and I use, you know, that in quotation marks, it's, it's a worm. It's a bug, right? I mean, larva is what we're talking about. Granted 40 foot long larva with massive teeth, but still larva. Yeah, it, it, I think what it was, and it's, I don't think it wasn't actually an an alien. It was a, uh, it was some sort of microscopic animal or parasite, I guess. Is, I guess we're going to guess what we're going with, and <laughs> they were spraying some sort of super enzyme all over this oil rig to try to clean up some sort of oil spill, and it. Except the guy did not mix the mix the formula correct, and so it um, super accelerated the growth of this this thing. But then it started like putting on its own egg sacs and hanging them from the ceiling and growing gigantic. Like no, oh, it was dumb. It's dumb, Brad. Well, this is one of those. Um it's a message movie, Paul, I think is what has you so angry here. I don't think you are willing to face your own mortality and take responsibility for what you're doing to the environment. I almost took my own mortality watching this movie. <laughs> the, um, you know, the, the central plot, of course, here is that uh, mankind is doing this to themselves or they're provoking this. You know, man's hubris, as they say, is manipulating the environment in an adverse fashion and has, uh, I guess, meets justice as a result of the manipulation of nature that they brought on. I really feel like I am overstretching (laughs) the reach of this film here. I'm, I'm really carting in a lot more metaphor and social commentary than they were managed in this script. And they did have a script. I will, uh, I will attest to that. I've got an interesting little sidebar on that one. Did they have a script before they started filming or while they were filming? Well, I mean, you know, you, you could behold this film and actually be surprised that a screenplay was involved in any capacity. But, yes, um, there was an early scene, I'm sure you remember, where um, after they showed a cartoon of a helicopter, they showed people inside of a helicopter transport. Yeah, mm-hmm. that was the worst some of the worst special effects I've ever seen. Yeah, they're they're flying over an animated ocean as a helicopter, quote unquote, in CGI form is heading to this oil rig, and then they cut inside. The pilot doesn't so much as steer this as he keeps reaching up to turn a dial on the ceiling. That's basically how he controls the helicopter. That also happened to be the director of the movie. No. Are you kidding me right now? The um 
yeah, the the actor for that role. Let's see, how did this play out? Um, they had oh such limited God, access right. to a cast. One actor fell out because of sickness. Another actor simply didn't show up. If you recall the closing scene where the uh, nefarious CEO was calling the guy out in the field who was in the ocean with the red uh, red overalls. Yeah. That was the script writer. <laughs> Stop. Really? The Yeah, the, the actor who was supposed to portray that role, I think, simply didn't show up, and they had to fill in. And here's the screenwriter struggling to speak the lines that he had actually written. Well, then what was the what did the lady that played the lead, what was her role outside the film? Because it sounded like somebody was feeding her her lines through an earpiece and she was <laughs> repeating them as they were being told to her. No, she's actually an actress of some renown. I mean, she's been in stuff. I'll put it that way. <laughs> Not that you've heard of her, probably, but uh, no, she's um, she's at least a performer, we can say here. But um yeah, they she was uh, in get Carter. <laughs> when that's the high water mark in your career. Yeah, pretty much. I was in she a was not good. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I went back and forth on her. I think what it is she just looked better by comparison, is what it comes down to. Uh, maybe. She she read her lines capably. I mean, at times she seemed to deliver some emotions. But um, yeah, I, I will <laughs> say she was the worst. She's the worst actor to me in this movie. Actress, actor, whatever you want to call him. The second one would have to be the mechanic, followed by Geo, the muscle Greenpeace fella. Those would be my bottom three actors in that movie. Mm. A lot of misogyny going on there, Paul. Well, I am what I am. I can't help it. <laughs> I will claim I, that title for this particular film. Yeah, I, I wasn't too impressed with the male figures. I mean, the I guess the lead echo terrorist was capable, but he uh, was the best one out of the group. Uh, he felt at least he felt natural when, when he was delivering his lines, regardless of how stupid they were. Mm -hmm. His stuff yeah, made she, sense. The, uh, the lead actress is a scientist, and she at least knew how to look into a microscope capably. I thought, oh, yeah, everybody I, I found that believable. Microscope. But that mechanic couldn't fix, a, couldn't fix an engine. Well, she was working on that same generator the entire time. Let me, I, I, look, I, I tweeted about this movie last night. And there's a scene at the beginning that absolutely bothers me and continues to bother me to this day. Ooh. He he's introducing uh, Jacob. Is he's the lead character here? It's on part of this cleanup crew. He leads the team, and he's introducing everybody that's on his team. And they're sitting inside what I can only describe as a closet that they were trying to pass off as a helicopter cockpit. Yeah, the, <laughs> the use of a stark red light actually really played a strong role in this scene. Right, and so there's a girl, and the girl is sitting next to him, and she's filing her nails the whole time. The entire time, she is she's giving herself a manicure. Diligently he, so. <laughs> oh, and then he introduces her as the quote-unquote grease monkey. The mechanic has long nails. Yes. Let yeah. me repeat that. The mechanic has long nails. Now, I don't know if the scriptwriter or the director or she took upon herself the liberty to add something in, but I have never met a mechanic, female or otherwise, that's had long nails because nobody wants that grease up underneath their nails. They keep them short for a reason. Well, and I don't know yeah. why would that bother me the whole time. Yeah, I mean, clearly, I mean, they either keep them short for purpose or not by choice because they end up cutting them on whatever machinery they're working on. But yeah, the, she is, she's working on like the generator of this oil rig and she spends 45 minutes of the movie at that same location. They shoot like through the machinery at her working. And we have this point of view shot, I think eight to 10 times in the film. Oh, and I don't know if you noticed this and the Foley artist in this, in this movie was horrendous. At one point, I honestly think he took a nap, but there was a there's a scene at the mechanic. She's she's reaching in, and she has a crescent wrench. Are you familiar with the crescent wrench? I've seen those, yes. 
it's an adjustable wrench, right? It's an adjustable wrench. She's using an adjustable crescent wrench. She has it on a nut, and she starts to spin it. And when she does, it makes the <laughs> ratchet. They added a ratchet wrench sound to a crescent wrench use. They might as well just said pew pew in it and be done. Let's start throwing laser sounds for no reason. Maybe a tugboat sound in there, too. Or um, An yeah, she's maybe, maybe she could have made a similar noise and pretended she was using a uh, pneumatic drill. <laughs> something, something to that effect. <laughs> That's cool. Brad, you do a real good pneumatic drill. That's pretty impressive, sir. You could have been the Foley artist in this movie. I, um, I have faked working in my past, I'll just have to say. I, I have a history of <laughs> manufactured <laughs> labor. <laughs> did, you notice, did you notice near the end where the giant, the rig is exploding and the lead character is running away from it, that there is literally no sound? None. There's no music. There's no explosion. There's no footsteps. There's no background noise. It just explodes on center screen with her running towards us, towards the camera, and there's no sound. They dropped all mm-hmm. sound out as if it was like an explosion in Star Wars. Well, uh, I don't think you understand how much sound costs, Paul. You know, that's, you're spending other people's money here, is what it comes down to. <laughs> that's got to be what it is. All right. Well, why don't we um, why don't we just launch into the plot of this? I think we've already picked apart a little bit of the making of this fiasco. Yes, Let's share do it. The magic of this. So share it with the people. We uh, we open with a handy cam shot in uh, day glow green because we have some environmental terrorists that are staging a late night attack on a location. This group is known as the Alliance for Green Protection. <laughs> the AGP, a really crappy acronym. Well done, guys. Nobody's going to have that on the end of their tongue. So um, they're going to hit this one. Uh, well, I guess they're hitting a headquarters first. But did you did you appreciate the scene where they called in the bomb threat? Yeah, I didn't understand the call on the bomb threat. I, and the, the person on the phone that they were talking to, I assume was an operator, was like, yes, I understand. Okay, I the, understand. The person they talked yes, to, understand. yeah, they, they could not be more disinterested in what these guys are telling them. This has to be one of those virtual office scenarios, you know, like where you check out at 5 p.m. and your calls get routed to another office in another part of the country. We're going to bomb the office. I hope you understand that. Yes, sir, I understand. You have planted a bomb. Okay, and the bomb is going to go off, and I need you to understand that. I understand that. I mean, this is the level of discourse going on with this grave scenario they're drawing up. So they hit these headquarters. They uh, they get their information off of a soft uh, a laptop software. They get all the information they need for their job. That was an awful scene, too. Oh, yeah. It was... Uh, Nearly unwatchable, but hey, that's the way you want to open your movie, isn't it? Try to be as distancing as possible to your audience. So, oh yeah, we uh, that's when we cut then to our star cast. It's a group of uh, four people that are going to decommission a an immense oil rig out in the ocean. Four people are going to do this. Oh well, yeah, you don't need more than that. So I don't know, Brad. You've clearly never cleaned an oil rig in the middle of the ocean. I have not. If you did, you you wouldn't be talking so ignorantly about about it. Well, uh, it's interesting. It that only takes four: up. one for the top, one for the middle, one for the bottom, and one to uh, supervise. Done. I'm I'm glad you brought up ignorance here because um, while they were. <laughs> kind of gearing up, you know, they were bringing their bags on and the grease monkey girl was tossing the bags down to one of the other men. She's telling them a story of their last job that they were on. Their, um, it was an oil freighter, I guess, had run aground or was sinking and they had to go patch the hole on this thing. She tells him that this was taking place off the coast of Bolivia, which is a <laughs> landlocked country that has no coastline. Well, and then she said that it he washed up on the shores of Morocco. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. parts of them. Did. That's so, the Atlantic. 
Yeah, his and there, Bolivia would be on the Pacific if it was anywhere. His his body parts somehow traveled across the ocean in a matter of weeks. Uh, no sea life whatsoever felt like consuming them. No. And uh, and yeah, he washes up on a beach another continent away by crossing a continent somehow. But they don't do anything with that story, right? Like it feels like they're setting that story up so that it. It explains what's going on here. Like it's followed them wherever they're at. It's not referenced ever again. No, they tell uh, this awful story that has no reference to anything else. Yeah, I was waiting. There was going to be a callback. I thought maybe somebody connected with the terrorist or something. No, there was nothing. So it just <laughs> nothing. Just let here's that a grim story. Here's the tool bag. Let's go work on the generator for seventeen days. <laughs> so the. The central plot is these guys are on board, I guess, to clean up this rig before it's decommissioned. Now, there's a multinational corporation behind all of this. And since they're featured in a film, they absolutely have to be evil. Well, duh. Just that's the rules of filmmaking. So what they do is deliver a parcel of chemicals to the oil rig. And... It's up to these workers to put together the chemical matrix of this new cleaning agent. Now, the CEO of the company calls the head scientist and tells her, of course, you know, the board is in a rush on this. You have to get this new enzyme employed over at the rig. And it's four months away. They're still in beta testing. It's not ready, but they have to hurry on this. Did you ever figure out why they were in a hurry? No, it never really made sense. And the other thing that didn't make sense is that, well, have you gotten to this part, the part where the guy hid the letter that had the formula on it? Oh, yeah, when he pulled the letter, the, the written the letter out, down the front. He, he right. opens it, he, he reads it, it says, dangerous, don't overmix, biochemicals. And then the guy who it was addressed to says, what are you doing? You're drinking on the job, blah, 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 I'll kick your ass. And, and then it stopped, and, and instead of giving him the letter, he just hides it in his pocket. And it was yeah. never addressed again. But the guy didn't go, hey, is there a letter here for me? I mean, there was like nothing. Right. So it's. Um, I think the screenwriter was probably too busy trying to learn his lines for the end of the movie. Yeah, you, they probably got notification. Stop writing and start learning your <laughs> writing, I guess. Memorize it. So uh, her name is Dr. Christina Hansen, and Christina is the one, I guess, that wrote this letter. So basically what we're talking about here is they have this new experimental chemical enzyme, and a variety of these chemical bins are on site, and they have to be mixed accordingly, just so. Why wouldn't, if this was such a pertinent part of the cleaning project? this new enzyme had to be mixed just correctly in the perfect fashion, why would you not send somebody out there to do it? Or, yeah, or why would you, send, why would you mix them? Yeah, mix it off site and then send it over here. What's the point of <laughs> I mean, sending them as virgin uh, chemicals and then yeah, you expect make sense. Your, uh, you, you expect your grunt workers on site to do the proper calibration on your chemicals. Well, Apparently, they got it wrong. They they begin cleaning this oil rig. And by cleaning, I do not mean shooting fire extinguishers all over the place. That's not what they were doing. They were cleaning it. Yeah, what were they using? Pressure washers or backpacks or some nonsense? No, they were, they were fire extinguishers. Because they even showed a close-up of the, you know, the long nozzle. Oh, that's right, yeah. And so, basically, they're just sending clouds of this stuff wherever the hell they are but just take our word for it they're cleaning the ship or the rig <laughs> whatever whatever you the see rig. going on there it's clean but out. it wasn't dirty i saw i saw no evidence of a dirty rig anywhere there's no oil floating there's not no oil sitting on the on the ceiling there's nothing uh, well so they're in the process of cleaning and um we see little snippets of some kind of movement in the shadows behind grating and stuff like that of some kind of creature that gets hit with this cleaning solvent and apparently manages to grow to an immense size and begin putting egg sacs all over the place as well. I'm not really sure how it 
started replicating. They didn't show uh, more than one at the time. Brad, but. if you don't know how animals replicate, you and I can have a conversation off air. Well, no, I, 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 I do know how they replicate. That's what my confusion is because uh, I, I saw a solitary creature. And, uh, and, so you, you too were taught that animals replicate by up, up chucking a pod and attaching it to the ceiling. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I know there are a couple of creatures that have an ability to do asexual, but I, I don't think it's chemically induced. It's not like you, you know, spray them down with Roundup and suddenly they start. I, don't know. I think there's a lot. There's probably a lot of reproduction happening at Burning Man when chemicals are introduced. I I don't uh, I don't have a way of refuting that, so I guess I have to agree. There we go. One hundred percent true facts. <laughs> the facts over here. So, um, so we do see, you know, more of this creature and, uh, you know, it's, it's starting to hang egg sacs down from a ceiling at the same time, our echo terrorists from the start of the film are helicoptering to the location as well. So we have, we ever figure out why? No, because we're, we're talking about echo terrorists wanted to go to an oil rig that is already decommissioned to exact echo terrorism some how. and not only is it decommissioned but it's literally being cleaned up yeah so what threat does it pose um see i'm i'm not an echo terrorist i have to come out right away and say that i'm you know i freely admit i'm not an echo terrorist so this might be why i'm confused as to their motivation but um yeah, yeah. this Maybe the dark web can explain it to us. Apparently, they had a very serious reason for going out there beyond just having more bodies on board to get attacked by these creatures. I'm guessing, because I wasn't shown or told. Um, so, yeah, they show up, and I have to appreciate their methodology, but again, I did come forth and say I'm not an eco-terrorist myself, so their methods are foreign to me, but I didn't understand why they would wear masks while they fly in and while they board and climb into the rig. And then when they meet the people that are on site, they take the masks off. Yeah. They're pretty much like all of them. I think were Spider-Man. They like to have a secret identity, but then they show it to everybody. Hmm. It, I mean, it's it just usually, you know, you wear masks for the sake of anonymity, not for the sake of breaking and entering. But Again, yeah, it didn't make any sense. Not, not, uh, you know, this isn't my, uh, my training, so I can't really question them too much, I suppose. Oh my God. You know what I just realized? At mm. the beginning of the film, when they call in that bomb threat, they're using a, one of those little small handheld Nokia phones. This movie was made in 2004. There were no such thing as burner phones in 2004. So that dude's making a phone call from a small handheld Nokia that, is attached to somebody's number and name inside of their own terrorist organization. Oh no, he's on the grid. <laughs> yeah, he's. Hey, uh, <laughs> let me go ahead and call somebody. You know who it probably was? It probably belong. It probably belonged to Valerie, the the, the main douchebag's uh, secretary that kept connecting him to all these different people. You know, the good girl, as he called her. <laughs> sure, you're a good girl. Well, they um. So they meet up with the uh, crew. They take them over with guns. They get control of their keys and such. The The doctor now is also um, helicoptered in at one point because uh, she was worried that they were mixing their chemicals incorrectly. And guess what? Turns out they were mixing their chemicals incorrectly. So while there's this conflict going on, the creature comes out. And everybody freaks out and panics, and there's a lot of mayhem and activity for a monster that we have to take their word for. Because they don't show it on camera. Pretty, pretty much the way I described the filming of the movie. The, uh, yeah, the magic of this scene was that it played out for a good minute or so, and... The primary focus of the cameraman was on one of the environmentalists as they were videotaping mm -hmm. the creature. Don't show on camera at all. 
but they yeah. do show an extended scene of them fighting over the keys to the door. I haven't figured out why the keys to the door were so important. Yeah, that you know, you got to capture that on camera, of course, but not not the creature itself, not the reason She's you're watching. Around, the look around the room. I have ever, that thing, she was like a she was like holding. Yeah, I just uh, sure. I definitely appreciate the fact that we got very intense focus on her Did as she was ever filming. Ever that showed was the footage of that? Did they anybody ever keep the footage? I don't think so. The the only time we really saw footage is when they sent that remote control car into the air ducts. Yeah, what was that? I haven't had one. I haven't seen. He said I haven't seen one of these since I was a kid. He hasn't seen a remote control car since he was a kid. Yeah, there's only more of them now than there were when he was a kid. But okay, let's be honest. The writing here, the writing in this movie is called straw. Yeah. Also, get very familiar with air ducts because they're going to figure prominently in this movie. The that majority of the dude, film takes place. I think the, I think they were in love with Die Hard because that one dude spends what the last forty five minutes of the movie in the in an air duct. I didn't I, even realize that there were that many air ducts on an oil rig and that they were connected in such a way where you could just traverse them all. I think we see at least three different scenes where he's shown taking grates off and climbing into it. We have the Echo Terrorist first coming on board through the air ducts. We have our main hero at one point walking or crawling through the air ducts. And there's a great bit of editing, too, where he, he's crawling forward and stops because there's one of these worms coming at him. These are um, you know very large worms and very constricted. He can't even move in the air duct. They cut to the worm for two seconds, cut back to him. He's completely flipped around, and now his feet are facing it while he crawls away. It had to well, fit in there to move around. I don't even get that. <laughs> and it wasn't like he turned a corner or something. It was like we see him react, cut to the worm, cut right back to him, and he's crawling away now. Okay. Thank you, director. So um, <laughs> we find out that Dr. Christine has a history. She used to be a member of this echo terrorist squad, and her and the lead have a bit of a uh, old – relationship that's still hanging in the air and she explains to him she's trying to fight the system from within so she's developed this new enzyme that's a cleaning agent that's supposed to be environmentally friendly and helpful so her new enzyme is going to clean oil rigs and protect the environment and save 500,000 fish from dying or it creates well, a brand new sense. species that will attack mankind on sight. You know, it's, you got a way to go with the bad, Brad. Some some risks are just worth taking. I think that's actually a line in the movie too. I think the I think the <laughs> CEO bad guy says that some risks are just worth taking. Now do your job and be a good girl. But, you know, I, I mean, normally we're getting the message in these, you know, usually it's either the military is manipulating nature in a way they shouldn't or there's a corporation that's playing God. You know, there's all these lessons to be learned. But here we have an environmentalist trying to do something good for the environment and provokes the same reaction somehow. But um, I did enjoy this, too. She figured this out when uh, she was looking at something in a microscope. And then says, we have to get this sample to the lab right away. They're on an oil rig. What lab are they talking about? Yeah, what, what she's lab? Not at, she's not at the corporation. What sample? <laughs> well, they, no. they did have that one, the first one they killed. I guess she was taking some flesh samples from and testing them. But then she needs to go and take that and go to the lab to analyze it correctly. The, the lab on the BP oil rig. I suppose. You know, the guy that took the envelope and hit it, the one that with the drinking problem, that they said he had a drinking problem, you mm -hmm. know, he was the first one to go. Spoiler alert. He's the first one to get eaten. And well, we have, the we have thing, to take it on the things are very, yeah, they're very small. Right? We the, never, the, at that, at the, 
we never see a kill take place. We always hear about oh, yeah. it. Oh, no, no, it happened. It, you see, he was he looked down into the vent, and the thing attacked him through the vent, and then, you know, that's it. That's all you saw at first. But at that time, those worms were, were tiny because it was they were, they were just starting to grow and feed. But then later, she, that lady comes in to change her clothes in the exact same locker room, and his entrails and e- blood and guts and everything are laying on the ground, and they're right next to her feet, and, like, nobody sees them or says anything about them. No one mentions that dude for the rest of the movie. He's yeah. just he's just gone. And, and he's one cares. of the original four. He's one of those that he was out there for that uh, oil tanker rescue off Bolivia's coast that doesn't exist. Well, what didn't make sense is he was the new guy, right? So he's having to be introduced to everybody on the on the plane or on the in the helicopter closet. Mm-hmm. He's having to be introduced. And she's explaining what happened to the other guy that we've already discussed that got washed up at Morocco. But everybody on the crew seems to know he has a drinking problem. Yeah. No, that's a given. Yeah. No one knows who he is. They're having to be introduced, <laughs> but they know he has, a, he has a personal drinking problem. And nobody misses him after he's dead. And nobody misses him after he's dead. Unless. That's a, I don't know if it's. Maybe it's possible that he drank so much that the other people blacked out about him. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm probably trying to fill in gaps here that the screenwriter wasn't capable of filling himself. But Well, that's a better story than what they told him in the movie. There was also this curiosity. Um, you know, we mentioned that the, uh, the grease monkey, the head mechanic of the crew, is this younger-looking female she's probably 25 or so Mm -hmm. and she's got this scar prominently on her arm and one of the other guys she works with asked her about the scar and said oh you know i'm I'm not going to give you the story behind that until we get to know each other better and he says come on we've worked together for 10 years right then in the third act, one of the echo terrorists is working alongside of her and asks her about it, and she just spills the story about the scar like in a heartbeat. Oh, yeah. Hey, that's not the only inconsistency they had with her. Now, she gets boobs come out in this movie. Uh, like, it just hits you in the face suddenly. Like, you're not even expecting it. So she, her and the Italian guy, who is as hairy as any person I've ever seen. He looks like a shag carpet with arms. And Mm -hmm. they're they're showering together, but not in a sensual way. More like in a starship troopers kind of way. They're just taking a shower together, right? And so she's naked and he's topless and all they show her boobs. And then she said, she's like got no problem being completely naked with him in the shower. And another dude who's getting dressed next to him, there's no shower curtain. He's just putting on his shoes and boots and, and pants standing right next to him. So she's got no issue with that. But then later, they're going, those same two showering people go up a ladder. Now, he has to follow her up, the, up this oil rig ladder. There's no, he has no choice. And he's looking up as he goes. Now, she's not wearing a dress. She's wearing a pair of pants. And she says, stop looking at my ass. Now, explain to me <laughs> the thought process behind being offended that somebody's having to look up as they go up a ladder with you in front of them. But not having a problem with being in a complete, completely naked with a coworker in your shower. I don't understand the writing of that. Yeah, there, there's a few things of that nature. Something else um, that takes place frequently in this movie is they repeatedly cut the power. They turn the electricity off, and this is a very big problem when it happens. Oh, well, that's and, because uh, the mechanic is not very good. I, I don't know if I blame her or not. She's trying to, you know, regenerate something. But, th- you know, this happens over and over again. And yet the lighting in this movie is consistent throughout, even when they're climbing through air ducts. Well, they're using that camera light the whole time. I mean, at no point in time, you know, they're, they're all expressing the times they've even said things to each other. It's like, well, we can't do it when the power's out. This is a fast light right behind them. Oh, yeah. And, uh, consistently how that works but that's just me that's what you don't understand in this movie uh, one of the things yeah <laughs> <laughs> the other thing too is i've seen the number of scenes where these worms 
can move extremely fast. Like as soon as they spot a human, they like shake around and shoot after somebody right away. But then our hero is going down that same ladder. You know, it's it's a ladder that's in in a sheet. They you know they have to climb up like 20, 30 feet basically in a tunnel with a ladder. He falls and breaks his leg because the worm is coming down after him. So he's on the ground, immobile, and the worm now stops. It, it oh, yeah. No longer go after him. He's prone. He's looking up hopelessly at it, and the worm is just like, I'll give you time. See what you know. See what you got to do to crawl off or something. And they cut back to the worm like three or four times while he's running, yeah, he, and groaning and crawling, and the thing does not shift its position where it's at up the ladder. Yeah, and then that girl comes and rescues him. Yeah, very valiantly so. She uh, she's the most capable person in this entire movie according to the script. My best, the, my favorite part of that particular scene is that all those containers have the enzyme chemicals in them. So she knows what's in those those containers. Mm-hmm. Yet she takes the time to open one and sniff it to see if it's flammable or not. But because I guess you can tell if something's flammable simply by sniffing it now. Suppose so, but again. And then she I, rips her shirt off like uh, she. It was a little reminiscent of what uh, Princess Amidala did with ripping her shirt while they were fighting in the in the ring. But she just <laughs> rips a whole piece of the bottom of her shirt off. So now she's wearing a halter top for no reason other than to show off her abs and uh, shoves it into one of those containers and throws it in there. But that wasn't. She didn't stop there. She kept throwing in containers <laughs> like it was a bonfire. She's getting ready to start up. Well, she was also wearing a uh, tank top, reminiscent of Die Hard. I mean, there's a there's a whole lot of movies that they managed to steal You're from right. and do they so like ineffectively. They did like a lot of Die Hard. And the um, now the culmination of this thing really makes no sense. They have to get to another part of the oil rig because there's an escape pod. I'm. Again, I, I'm also not an oil derrick worker. I'm not sure what escape pods on an oil derrick consist of. They make it sound like it's going to shoot off into the atmosphere. And that's or something. that's escape pods are But I, um, they they have to go out in the storm to get to this other area. They have well, to turn on a second generator. Can you hear me? Yeah, I got you now. You're breaking up a little bit. Oh. I was going to say that the pod was the most realistic part of this movie. Is that so? Yeah. uh, So my brother works on a coal barge between Canada and the United States. And it's, they're on the great lakes and they are required to have pod training. So those pods hang, they're, they're basically lifeboats with uh, tops on them that completely seal up. So when they drop off the water, they crash nose first and then the buoyancy will bring them back up. It's not like uh, previous times where you would see lifeboats drop over the side with two ropes. It takes too long to lower, and you've, we've all seen the problems with stuff falling on top of it. This is a completely hard plastic shell covering the boat. It's got uh, yeah. food and life support and stuff like that in there, and that that's a real thing, and it's the most realistic thing in this movie. Well, all right, then. I, I, I know. Stand- How about that? I stand corrected. <laughs> I, as I want, it's the only reason I gave this movie half a star. I'll uh, I'll give it credit for having something accurate, uh, <laughs> and then from and then from there it's all it's all utter garbage. Yeah, this uh, the the accuracy here leaves something to be desired, <laughs> and this is I'm I'm just look at me you've got me floored now I'm actually shocked that there's some accuracy <laughs> in this thing I don't know how to, how to react anymore but you're welcome I like to blow your mind Brad. Yeah, because this movie didn't do it enough. You you had to actually augment that reality for me. So thanks. You're welcome. The, um, <laughs> so basically where they need to go is they have to go across a gangplank to get to this other area. Now the Grease Monkey and one of the environmentalists are together. And as soon as they get into the door, 
Well, this, this is the part that cracked me up. They run over to the door, then they stop to have a conversation in a monsoon instead of going into the door and then talking. But once they get in, they realize there's actually worms in that portion of the oil rig itself, even though they have not been to that part of the rig to clean yet and have not been affected by the chemicals, they're there. So those two meet a demise. And at some point in time, the main electrical cable gets severed. Did you catch that when that happened? Yeah, she pulled it apart. So as the worm grabs the grease monkey and pulls her into the cabin and is starting to eat her, which, by the way, did you notice that it completely stripped all of her skin from the breast down? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It ate, it ate all of her skin up from starting to the top of the breast all the way down. It was actually one of the better graphic scenes of the movie. Well, but again, she, we don't she, see it. She opens the door. We see the yeah, actual effects. It's always, you know, she's laying on the ground with makeup on her. We don't see the actual creature interact with anybody. Yeah, exactly. Well, she tries to escape by opening the door, and she reaches for the power cable to try to pull herself out, but the power cable comes apart instead. Well, okay. I Again, I saw that part. I, I did see that, but later when our hero is out there trying to connect the cable, I mean, if you look at it, it's severed. It looks like somebody took a hatchet to it, not pulled two couplers oh, apart. Oh, I got you. Yeah, she didn't pull I got you. She literally ripped the wires apart. Yeah, I mean, you got two open-end bare wires on this main line. <laughs> I was like, wait a maybe, second, she did that? Maybe being, eat by, maybe by being eaten by a worm makes you super strong. Could be. Could be. Well, did you? This is another part that baffled me. Um, the <laughs> I think it was just before their scene. The the or her suit, you know, the uh, the rug shag carpet guy was in a panic about stuff, and he ends up pushing his coworker over a rail, and we get a rail plunge from this guy supposedly. And then five minutes later, he pops up in the air vent with him. Oh yeah, he did. A, he pulled an old bird of prey scene. I mean, because he's like in a panic. He's like, I can't take it anymore, and I can't take you. And he pushes him over the rail for no reason. And we see camera shooting up, and we see a rail plunge. We don't see the after effects. We're like, now I'm wondering. Maybe the worms are affecting him. Maybe he got bitten at some point, and it's affecting his mind. Maybe. Nope, he's just next, crawls into another air duct, and as he turns a corner, the guy that he just pushed over a few minutes ago crawls up behind him. What? Yeah, he he he, he found him. He caught up and found him. <laughs> what, and then the he leaves him to die again. I, I, you know, they missed, a, they missed a, a, a really good opportunity to put in an extra death scene. Yeah, the dude that carried the picture of his wife because I guess he lost her in a plane crash or something. And I don't know where that character development came from, but it went nowhere. He's crawling through, you know, we will call him um, John, John McLean. And he's crawling around the ducks and he gets to a corner and they turn the power back on and the circulation fan starts running super fast. And now he's stuck between a worm and a fan, a, a moving fan. So you're thinking, okay, he's going to get eaten by the worm, but then the power shuts off again, and the fan stops. You're thinking, oh, this is a good opportunity for him to sneak to the fan, but they don't know where he's sneaking. They're going to turn it back on, and it's going to cut him in half. And I'm like, oh, okay, all right, let's make this happen. They never made that happen, but they teased that happening multiple times. Yeah, yeah, they, and again, you know, with, among the multiple power outages and such, but um, like, did they uh, not set that up? Was that not teased? Yeah, that was yeah, a total tease, and they didn't do anything with it. Well, see, I think what's happening here is that you and I have kind of like a, a certain level of training in our minds. Like anybody else who has seen a movie before, I don't think the people that made this film saw too many movies outside of like three that they stole from. I don't. I don't think they need to have like uh, enough of a feeling for you know these plot beats, <laughs> movie tropes and such. And oh, we should do something with that fan and make it grip. Nip, he just crawls through it, and that was cool, wasn't it? You see him crawl? He crawls. He crawls through that fan. Wow, it's fantastic that he spends the last forty-five minutes of the movie crawling through a, the air ducts just to fall out of an air duct and to get eaten by a worm. 
Well, yeah, he I mean, decapitated. He was a decapitated worm decapitation. I, I think maybe the air duct served as a metaphor for the internal digestive system and pre- prepared him for it. I'm guessing here. I don't know. See, now that would be a good movie if the oil <laughs> rig was alive and he was crawling through the intestines the whole time and the oil rig was trying to kill him. See, that's a movie. Yeah, because, you know, you know, maybe a, a closing shot where it cranes back and we actually see that the oil rig itself is uh, animated and comes to life. And they've already call been it. consumed. They're already in this. No, this, this is right. You call it death rig. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it would be on par with Ghost Ship, another straight to video. Uh, we might have piece to watch of magic that I've seen. Oof. Doesn't it have like what's her name from ER? Uh, uh, Marga- in the good yeah, Margulies is in that one. Yeah, from the Good Leanne. Life. Look at us now. We we've gotten so bad we're lapsing into talking about better movies, and Ghost Ship is considered <laughs> a better movie. A better movie. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so. Oh, my gosh. Uh, I guess we have to wrap this up only to end our pain. <laughs> and You know what? And, and I watched Fantasy Island this week, so this is two stupid movies you I've watched. Uh, I, I'm eager to go see that. I'm going to try to get to it this weekend if I can. Can eager I just say it. that I, I'm very surprised. Just, uh, just a, a quick Fantasy Island recap. Very quick. It's not a good movie. It's not a completely awful movie. It's just a weird confusing movie there's not really any good acting in it at all the writing is very weak but for a pg-13 bloomhouse film i was surprised to not see any tna there's plenty of hot models in bikinis but there's no tna there's only one cuss word in the entire movie and there is there are no bloody scenes but this is supposed to be a horror film this is this supposed to be a horror film? And, and, like, and it's supposed to be a Bloomhouse horror film. Right, right. It's, um, which usually has that kind of stuff in it somewhere. None of that was present. And I was that part disappointed me a little bit. Yeah, there's a... Uh, Outside of the disappointment that I had overall for the film. but A lot of, uh, a lot of things that are... Uh, they're, they're breaking a lot of rules there. I'm very upset with uh, Jason. <laughs> you know, it would have been good if they were breaking rules to like to step out of the norms of that kind of filmmaking, but they didn't do anything different or interesting by stepping out of the, you know, out of that norm. They didn't do anything with it. They just didn't do it. They didn't do something to replace it. They just didn't do that. And that was even more disappointing. You know what I mean? Like they could, they had an opportunity there to do something completely different with it. And and Wadlow didn't do anything with it at all. Uh, I'm going to have to go on Yelp and uh, make some comments, it sounds like. But. Definitely. All right. Well, we do. Uh, we got to try to lurch our way to a climax here. And the hero and heroine, they managed to get to the escape pod area without any other worms getting them. But in order to do so, they have to regenerate the power converter over on that side. So it'll generate the escape pod. So he has to go out in the rain and connect these two cables together. They're sparking across each other, and for the life of me, I can't figure out how he did not get fried into a patty of crab rangoon because he's soaking wet in a rainstorm (laughs) with all of this power arcing in his arms, and nothing happens to him. It's mystifying. But as he's doing this, we get a shot from below. He was protected by love. Is that is that what we're going to resort to? That's okay. what we're going with. I'm going with protected by love. So we see one of these giant worms now crawling on the underside of the gangplank where he's standing, and he freaks out and he hits the worm with both of the cables, connecting the circuit and catching it on fire. Now this part cracked me up. The worm is about to explode. It catches on fire. He says out loud. Oh, no, because he realizes that this flaming 30-foot worm is going to fall down and create an explosion. How in the hell did he know this? Uh, have you, you didn't know that worms explode upon impact? Exploding I, I worms is a real, th- it's a real thing. 
the way they justified it is it landed like on a pile of barrels ostensibly filled with caustic flammable chemicals but he's an interloper he just showed up at this rig out of the blue he knows nothing about this thing so how did he know at that specific point that he was at a 60 foot drop of a flaming worm is going to cause a pyrotechnic explosion uh, it, maybe he was hoping that a 60 foot worm would cause a pyrotechnic explosion because, you know, he, he jabs the worm and he's like, there, got it. And the thing catches fire and he's like, oh, oh, no. I mean, literally in a state of panic as the thing starts to descend. But um, he makes it to the escape pod. You know, he's basically wounded, barely alive. And she's, you know, doing everything she can to sustain him. And then the pod won't launch for some reason. Launch aborted, we see on the screen. Because yeah, and that's, this is this is where the pod stuff that I told you about that was accurate turns completely false. They're mechanical launches. They, they're for that very reason. Yeah, so they can't launch. The oil rig proceeds to grow in magnitude of explosions while they're trapped inside this thing, and then it somehow does get released. And we see an on-screen graphic of this going through, I guess, tubes and such before it releases into the ocean. So it's almost like they have to go down a roller coaster to get to the water instead of, like, just over the edge, which would be the most efficient. Yeah. Yeah, that... All right, so that can sometimes be accurate. Again, here I come, Paul, feeding you with with the pod education. That can sometimes be accurate depending on the the level at which the pod needs to drop. If it's too high, they will slow it down by making it go up and come out and lose velocity. Because if it goes too fast, it could flip over. It could, it it won't smash. But if it's too high going too fast, it could go too far down, come up upside down, and then you got a really big problem. So they'll slow it down by making it go up a small hill. But it uses the same technology or the same uh, physics principles behind a roller coaster using wow. hills to slow slow its velocity down i know i'm sorry i didn't mean to pod educate twice in one one sitting no no it's uh i i gotta be completely honest with you watching this movie i did not think it would result in me actually learning something <laughs> uh, you can thank my brother for that one he's he's the one that actually told me stuff about it <laughs> I uh, I honestly thought I was going to have cerebral degradation as a result of this movie. So you've at least brought me back from that edge. I appreciate this. So you're welcome. I, I'd hate to lose you, Brad. You're a good friend. <laughs> and so our our heroes are in the water, and we watch the uh, oil rig, or I should say, maybe a matte drawing of an oil rig become animated <laughs> in flame. <laughs> And explode and debris and just get basically gets blown to hell. And uh, the corporation giant, the uh, nefarious bad guy back in the office, he calls the guy in the field who would be the script writer, finds out a few details, and then the tables are turned. There's actually an Shyamalan like twist in this movie. <laughs> I. I swear oh, to God, I'm trying yeah. to build, I am trying to build this up into anything resembling a motion picture. Yeah. The, um, the lead scientist was, I guess, coerced back into her life as an echo terrorist. And she exposed all the nefarious dealings of the CEO and released that information to the corporate board heads and to the media. And then he gets a phone call from, I, almost the same secretary that the terrorist spoke to at the beginning of the movie where she could not be more excited about the fact that, um, sir, there's a phone call that came in for you. I said, no phone calls. I'm watching a video. Uh, it is the CEO of the corporation and he has arrived with some police as well, sir. Good girl, Valerie. Good girl. So our dispassionate secretary delivers the final blow and our CEO ostensibly is arrested and meets his comeuppance. I assume so because they rolled credits over that closing dramatic delivery. Um, sir, sit, the police are here to arrest you. They are in the office. 
Roll uh, credits. Movie. They're, well, they're setting up Parasite 2. Electric Boogaloo. <laughs> Shockingly, there has been no follow-up. So, Did you know this movie aired on Sci-Fi Channel in 2004 or 2005? Uh, it would not shock me. It's uh, Now, it, you know, Sci-Fi Channel has always been known for its asylum style of movies. I mean, you, we are big fans of the asylum movies over here. This mm-hmm. was clearly below their grade, so this was a, this was not even asylum level type quality. This was something completely different. So I don't I mean, know if this, produced this or what happened, but sci-fi got a hold uh, of that. This was two thousand and four, two thousand five. Might even before they became sci-fi, and they might have still been the science fiction channel back then. It might have been, yeah. So but back they then they doing... were known for playing really bad sci-fi movies, like just awful ones. Oh yeah, and they, and they weren't self-produced, so they probably went out and. Paid, paid like five, for this yeah five thousand bucks for this one and uh, got to air it and make a because the asylum basically became a feeder line for their content after a while so this is pre i'm sure this is pre-asylum so yeah it would easily. make sense easily, but somehow right, this well, got, on, got on got on camera we're gonna have to wrap this up so we can uh, finally give way to our uh very good friends over at another bleeping podcast are um yeah well, well let's take a break and come back and talk about it some more <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I i've done more justice to this movie than it definitely deserves and we did it for our oscar and it was educational you learned something I do want to say this, though, in closing, a couple of DVD recommendations uh, that came out this week. One's called Invasion Planet Earth. This is a crowdsourced, partially funded film, 17 years in the making. Good gravy. Goes straight to video. (laughs) Wow. Wow. Basically, it, it's something of a send-up of the uh, Invasion movies. They, they kind of make it up to be like a 70s action, almost like a Charlie's Angels, Six Million Dollar Man type of production, I think is what they were going for. So you got to look at it with a little bit of a wry eye. One other one, um, really kind of surprising to me. It's called Disturbing the Peace. And um, it, it's a is curiosity... Is that a Samuel L. Jackson movie? Uh, no, it is actually a Guy Pierce movie. If you were wondering what Guy Pierce has been up to, struggling to find any kind of work in order to keep his SAG card valid so he could still collect the insurance. This one, he is a, um, I guess, down on his luck cop in Texas who hasn't handled a gun in years until a biker gang comes into town to commit a major heist. And he finally is inspired to rear back up. He's a marshal who is a former Texas Ranger. Again, this is Guy Pierce, who I believe hails from the country of Australia. Sure, he's, might, a, I'm not sure. he's a Texas Marshal, Texas Ranger. Let's just go with that. So, um, yeah, if you're, if you're looking for a real laughable piece of action there you go go check it out all right let's uh oh man devin sawa's in this movie i love you some devin sawa well there you go see i've i've brought some sunshine after forcing you to watch this bleak (laughs) anti-oscar film this week so i feel a little bit better now (laughs) so well i'll just say if um if you guys really want to go out and suffer you could find this delectable piece of Drek on Tubi TV. This is a relatively, it's been around for a while, but it's become broadly available in the last couple of months. Uh, they have a lot of garbage movies on there as well. You could even probably get an app on your TV and watch it on the big screen. That's and I think, I Paul, you had the best recommendation if you want to really replicate the uh, the Oscar feel of this, put the subtitles on as well. Oh, for sure. Yeah, you got to follow <laughs> everything that's happening. All right, Paul, where can everybody find you? Oh, I'm still over at Screen Rant. I'm covering board games now, so come check that out. Is this going to be a regular feature for you then? I think so, yeah. I think we're going to – my first review, I believe, it comes out next week. So that will be my second board game in article. Yeah, yeah. So I'm looking forward to diving into more of that. 
Very cool. Well, uh, for myself, you can find me pretty much all over the internet. I'm at Red State. I'm at Twitchy on a regular basis. Sometimes I'm at the Federalist. And every Thursday, I am here on KLRN. Next week, I'll be doing the Culture Shift with Ordy Packard. And if you have a need for any day-to-day involvement with me, go check me out on Twitter at Martini Shark. And also, go check out our show page. You can put in Disasters in the Making. You'll come up to our page. I try to... Uh, get some updates on there of the crap side of hollywood throughout the week and prep you for what's coming up as well so with that in mind gather up your popcorn buckets your cups and wrappers toss them out on the way out and we will see you folks in two weeks thank you very much